So now they are getting in. Ali? Yes. Hello, when we Ali? when we show with the mouse, it's it's showing or not? Um, yes. yes. Yes, it does show. Yeah. Okay.
please go ahead. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this ERS webinar on COVID-19 and the pulmonary circulation. I'm Anita Simons, the current president. This is a tremendously exciting area and we have learned much in the last few months on the impact of COVID on the pulmonary circulation, on thrombogenesis, on angiogenesis, and the effects on our patients with pulmonary vascular disease. We have a very exciting program for you with three excellent speakers. We're going to run through the presentation the three presentations first, and then you're very welcome throughout to add questions, any questions you have throughout the presentations to the chat box. Please add them to the chat box. I'll hand over now to Professor Marc Humbert from Paris. He is our president-elect and he's kindly devised this program. Marc. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anita. It's a great pleasure, a great honor to be with you today. Um, I, I would like to thank everyone for joining this ERS webinar on such an exciting topic with an excellent faculty. And uh, I would like uh, to start without further introduction with uh, our first speaker, um, uh, Professor Eric Clark, who is going to discuss COVID-19 associated coagulopathy and thromboembolic disease. Um, as you may know, Eric Clark is a board certified internist with a specialty in vascular medicine in the Leiden University Medical Center in the Netherlands. He also holds a position as visiting professor at the Center for Thrombosis and Hemostasis in Mainz in Germany. This allows him to uh, combine clinical work with scientific activities. His research interests are very broad and include the diagnosis, the treatment, and the long-term complications of venous thromboembolism. Thank you very much, Eric, for joining us, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Mark. I will move on. Yes. It's my honor and pleasure to be invited in this exciting webinar, and I thank the organizing for providing me the opportunity to discuss this very important topic. So COVID-19 associated coagulopathy and thromboembolic disease. <clears throat> These are my disclosures. From the first publications on COVID-19, we've learned that one particular aspect of the disease is a coagulopathy which is here shown in the first two papers from China and the JAMA and in the Lancet, showing us markedly elevated D-dimer levels in most patients, and especially those with the worst prognosis who in the end die of the disease. We all know that uh, coagulopathy may occur in patients with severe infections, but we also know that these uh, clotting abnormalities, this clotting activation is associated with a high risk of both thrombosis as well as on bleeding. And a little bit to our surprise, uh, thrombotic complications were not mentioned at all in these first publications. So when COVID struck Europe, uh, the, our colleagues here in Leiden, but also in many other European uh, hospitals, actually looked closely for those thrombotic complications. And here you can see more or less the first four uh, publications on this topic. And importantly, in those initial presentations, in these initial publications, it was described that there was a very high incidence of COVID-19 associated venous thromboembolic disease, ranging from 17 to 70 percent, especially in critically ill patients admitted to the ICU. In addition to these first clinical report that observed high incidences of thrombosis, there were also the first autopsy studies showing us exactly the same thing. So large areas of microthrombosis uh, in the lungs, and mostly in the affected areas of the lungs, but also macrothrombosis pulmonary embolism, as you can see in uh, picture C, and deep vein thrombosis, as you can see in picture D. So this shows us that thrombotic complications do occur and do occur in a high frequency in patients admitted with COVID-19. The question is, how often does it occur? What is the so-called true incidence? And this is a very difficult to answer question. 
At the moment, there are more than 25 meta-analyses published on this topic, and they all show more or less the same conclusions. But I'd like to take a very close look at the data pooling of those meta-analyses as shown here on the slide. This is a very good meta-analysis by colleagues from Vienna, published in RPTH. And you can see in the graph that there are actually two parts of the data pooling, studies in which it was described that the patients were only diagnosed or that were subjected to diagnostic tests if they were suspected of having VTE. And the lower part of the graph shows our studies in which patients were screened for VTE. And you can see that in the studies where screening was not performed, the incidence, the pooled incidence was 9.5%. And in the studies where screening was actually performed, the incidence was 40%. However, when you take a good look at the data, there is a very wide range of reported incidences of both groups. And those incidences very much depend on the case mix, on local settings, on thresholds for uh, performing diagnostic tests for uh, VTE, uh, on local thromboprophylaxis schemes, um, and most of all, whether patients were at the ICU or not. So you can appreciate from the large heads of MT you can, that you can see in this graph that we actually do not know the exact instance of VTE. And it's probably very much different per country or even per site, again, depending on the situations that I just uh, discussed. Even so, we must remember from this graph that when we look for VTE in COVID-19 patients, we will find VTE. So we have, should have a very low threshold in identifying those patients who benefit from anticoagulant treatment. So do we see more thrombotic complications in COVID-19 patients than in other populations? The answer is probably yes. Of course, it's very difficult to establish because the circumstances are completely different now than they were one year ago. But this is a very important study from France, one of the first publications on the topic. It shows us in the red um, marked area that the risk of thromboembolic complications and especially pulmonary embolism in patients admitted to three ICUs in France was 6.2 times higher compared to patients admitted to the same ICUs with ARDS from, for other reasons uh, uh, in the year before the COVID-19 um, uh, actually uh, induced the pandemic. So yes, probably we see more thrombotic complications in COVID-19 patients and in patients with ARDS, although Perhaps it's also so because of we know of this large high incidence that we perform more diagnostic tests in the COVID-19 patients. And that this higher risk may be a little bit overestimated, but still uh, you cannot deny that an odds ratio of 6.2 is very considerable. We can say the same for other complications. This is from a large US uh, population-based database showing us uh, that the risks of deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, and coagulopathy is very much higher in those patients admitted to hospitals with COVID-19 than those admitted with influenza. Again, very strong data confirming the fact that COVID-19 is associated with an extreme risk of VTE. So now we've established the fact that COVID-19 may cause uh, VTE in many patients, there are three million dollars questions to be answered. First, how can we best prevent COVID-19 associated thrombosis? Second, how can we best diagnose uh, VTE? And lastly, how can we best treat VTE? And before I will show you my best practice, I have to warn you that we're entering the so-called evidence-free zone because there are no randomized trials yet that can tell us the optimal way of, of management. So we have to rely on our experience with non-COVID-19 patients and a bit on straightforward thinking. So I'd like to hear your opinion on this. And uh, the question is, would you treat your hospitalized COVID-19 patients with more intensive anticoagulation than routine thromboprophylaxis? And the answers could be no, I will just use the same, or yes, I probably chose choose an intermediate dose anticoagulation and see, uh, yes, I will choose full dose anticoagulation. So I'm very curious to your practice in your hospital. What do you do with those patients when you admit them? We'll wait a little bit uh, for the 
results. So you can answer directly in the poll that's appearing on your screen. Perhaps you can take a look at the results from the poll. Let's see. So the majority here chooses uh, intermediate dose anticoagulation, which is recommended by some, but not all of the guidelines. Okay, so what do we know? We know that there have been post hoc analysis of patients that are mostly treated with anticoagulants for something else than COVID-19, such as atrial fibrillation or prior VTE. And patients on chronic anticoagulation seem to have less risk on being diagnosed with VTE, but have the same risk on death as patients without chronic anticoagulation. And also there are some studies, this is a study from New York published in JAK, showing us that there probably, but this is all post hoc and not randomized data, little difference between prophylactic and therapeutic anticoagulation with regard to survival. Evidence-based medicine guidelines, such as the guideline from ASH, recommend against more intensive anticoagulation than standard dosing. More, let's say, expert opinion-based guidelines actually uh, propose to increase the doses of uh, thromboprophylaxis to an intermediate dose. And the ERS guideline actually uh, says that it cannot make a choice because of the lack of data. But there are currently more than 20 randomized controlled trials going on which will show, hopefully show us the answer to this question within the next months. And until then, there's room for prophylactic, standard prophylactic, but also for more intense um, prophylactic doses, especially in those patients admitted to the ICUs. So how do we do the diagnosis? I will be very short on this one. I propose to always follow established algorithms. Why? We have no reason whatsoever to believe that they are less safe than in a normal situation. They may be less efficient because the D-dimer levels may be high, but especially when a D-dimer dependent uh, on the pretest probability uh, algorithm is used, still a considerable number of patients can be managed without doing a CT. And the CT, of course, there's transport of the patient, there's a risk of contamination of um, the radiology department um, uh, physicians. Uh, so we have to prevent those patients from having to move to the CT scan if possible. So please follow uh, the standard guidelines with regard to the diagnostic assessment of pulmonary embolism. Third, a multiple choice question I have for you is, how long would you usually treat a patient with COVID-19 associated pulmonary embolism? So if you have made the diagnosis of PE, would you treat the patient for three months, six months, 12 months, or would you consider indefinite treatment? Again, I'm very curious to learn about your current practice. So three months, six months, 12 months, or indefinite. So perhaps you can take a peek already to what the voting has resulted in. So the majority would chose a relative short period, three to six months, and discontinue after that. All right, very good. Again, there are no strong guidelines. If we would follow the current guidelines that are not on COVID-19, we would probably consider this to be a true provoked pulmonary embolism. And this reason, we can consider a short duration of treatment of three months. Which anticoagulant anti therapy should we choose then? Well, it depends on the patient, of course. If the patient is critically ill, admitted to the ICU, you probably will treat with uh, parenteral anticoagulation, low microwave heparin or infectionated heparin. If the patient is acutely ill at the ward or even at home, then you can choose for low microwave heparin as initial treatment or directly start with the DOAC according to the label of those drugs. We have little awareness of any relevant interactions between the current optimal treatment of COVID-19 and DOAC. So they are actually safe to take as initial treatment as long as the patient is able to uh, take oral medication. So lots of research needs to be done and lots of research is going on. This is just a peek on what's going on in the Netherlands. So the Dutch COVID and Thrombosis Coalition they have a five-year package strong uh, 
a study program in which almost all hospitals in the Netherlands participate and they will look to the pathophysiology of uh, COVID-19 associated thrombosis, but also to the optimal treatment, prevention and long-term consequences, because this is very important. We should very much consider probably that those patients develop chronic thrombotic pulmonary hypertension, considering the state of inflammation where they are getting the blood clots. We will know only um, in some time from now uh, if the incidence of CTF indeed is higher than expected. So my take home messages, COVID-19 cohorability is real. We should have a low threshold for considering VTE, but follow uh, normal diagnostic algorithms. The guidelines have been updated and will be updated over the next few months towards strict thromboprophylaxis. And we don't know yet if more than standard thromboprophylaxis is actually beneficial or harmful to the patient. And normally we would treat those patients with a DOAC for a duration of three months. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Please send in your questions. And uh, I hope to have a very vivid discussion at the end of this webinar. Thanks very much, Eric. That's a great start. And as he says, please um, put your suggestions and questions into the chat box. We move straight on and our next speaker is Professor Maximilian Max Ackerman. He's from the University of Mainz uh, Institute of Pathology and Molecular Pathology. And he also works in the Helios University Clinics in Wuppertal in Germany. And his main interest is vascular pathology and angiogenesis and tumor growth, inflammation, and interstitial lung disease. Max, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, Professor Simons and uh, Professor Ambel, thank you very much for the invitation for this webinar. I, I think it's a very relevant topic to talk about the pulmonary circulation and COVID-19. Uh, so the controls. So for my... Uh, disclosure, I only have a funding of the National Institute of Health. And for us as pathologists and anatomists, it was a big question at early of this year to get an understanding of these um, unknown disease in February and uh, March and April. So we started in um, doing autopsies on COVID-19. And that's to get an insight into this kind of disease. So what we see is, as an anatomist and pathologist seeing is believing, we saw on a cross appearance a very patchy lung with a very patchy orientation of blood vessels. You see that on the left, it's, it seems that the lung has a very heterogeneous perfusion. Secondly, we uh, took a, a picture of scanning electron microscopy to get an insight into the lung. You see in the middle of this uh, row, a picture uh, of an alveolus, which is, has a preserved architecture, but which is filled with farprin, which is filled with red blood cells and lymphocytes. So this looks quite different to that what you see on the right picture. It's a very preserved lung on the right. But the first impression is if you compare that with the diffuse alveolar damage, which you normally see in influenza or other viral disease, that the lung arctic architecture is more or less preserved. What you see, you have in the intra-alveolar space an edema and uh, accumulation of fibrin and, and other cells. So what is the specific COVID-19 lung injury pattern? If you compare it, so you see on the left uh, picture in the first row, uh, the subpleural space of a COVID-19 death of the lung and you see at some spaces a dilatation of the alveolar ducts. And this is what we also could uh, confirm with the regular IgA staining that the architecture is preserved, but the diameter of alveolar ducts is dilatated. On the same way, you see on the alveolar itself filling with the uh, fibrin, with the edema and cells. And on this area of the alveolar and the alveolar ducts, you find thickening by fibrin, these so-called hyaline membranes. So hyaline membranes are very um, um, unspecific finding in each lung disease, viral lung disease, but in COVID-19, it was really um, dramatically increased. First of all, if you compare the, the weight of these lungs, so it, this is uh, also a marker for us in pathology, 
the lung weight of COVID-19 lungs was more than two kilograms. So normally uh, both lungs together has a, a weight of one kilogram and 400 grams. Whereas in COVID-19, that's more than two kilograms. So 2,000 grams, 2,500 grams. So the first impression for these lungs is also uh, a perivascular vascular inflammation. So you see it on this picture on the left, on the upper, on the lower row. Um, it's a perivascular infiltration of cells. And we did a multiplex immune phenotyping of these cells. And these cells are predominantly CD4 and CD8 cells. So less B lymphocytes, more CD4 and CD8 cells. Yeah, then uh, to get an uh, impression of the whole lobe, because uh, we took for sure both lungs and also the different lobes. Uh, we analyzed these lung lobes by a synchrotron radiation. Uh, this is a technique um, on, on some places in Europe. So there is a big beam line in Grenoble and another one in uh, Oxford in the diamond beam line. Thereby we can analyze um, the whole uh, lung architecture and the parenchyma by this um, uh, radiation. And the morphology shows the same what we observed also in uh, HE staining. Uh, you have a dilatation of the alveolar ducts plus uh, atelectasis for sure of the alveoli. And around these dilatectic uh, airways, you find nearly these hyaline membranes. And uh, on the red, uh, or on the, uh, the red cells that are marked here, these are lymphocytes. You see that's a diffuse infiltration of lymphocytes next to the, the airways and next for sure to the blood vessels. And then the question was why we find these very, very specific perivascular inflammation in these uh, COVID-19 patients. So the, um, the clinical findings at, in, in China last year and also the beginning uh, of this year in Europe showed that there must be something around the blood vessels. And the idea was from our group, there must be an infection of blood vessels as we observed that maybe in parvovirus B19 virus or other virus disease. Um, and because the changes of the microvascular architecture was so traumatic. So we did our visualization of the SARS-CoV-2 virus by a fish. And you see that here that the virus affects not only um, pneumocytes type 1 cells and type 2 cells, but also especially endothelial cells. Uh, you can see that here on the arrowheads in this fish probe. And you can compare that with another technique. It's an old technique. It's transmission electromicroscopy. So uh, you can analyze cells um, by the ultrastructure. What you see here on the left picture, that's an endothelial cell and the lumen of these blood vessels. So um, the cell itself is, looks very, very destroyed. And if you look into the cell, which is on the right picture, you see little particles. And these are virus-like particles because the virus itself affects endothelial cells. And uh, the replication of the virus happens within the cells on their endoplasmatic reticulum um, in type one, type two cells, but also in endothelial cells. And it's, it's sure if you destroy endothelial cells, if you lead to these endothelial dysfunction, it's clear that you see also an impairment of the blood flow. And that's the reason uh, if you destroy endothelial cells and the blood flow that you provoke thrombosis and a microangiopathy. And that is what we see also in our samples on different stages. First of all, um, it's in the micro vessels, so vessels lesser than 500 uh, microns in diameter, but also in some rare cases, for sure, also in the bigger vessels. But the common finding was that it's seen in the micro uh, vessels. You see it on A, on this picture here, this is the thrombus, which is marked, which is include mostly the whole blood vessel here. Same here on HE stain, it's completely full. And we did a micro CT analysis of the bronchus itself and um, the blood vessels, which are running in parallel to that. 
And what you see is that you have a narrowing of the blood vessel and narrowing for sure also of the bronchus. So you shut down uh, the bronchus and the ventilation of the secondary pulmonary lobule by for sure having an occlusion of the blood vessel. So this is what we learn in medical and med school, the all start mechanism. At all, we count these thrombi. So we realized nine times more thrombi in COVID-19 um, patients than in influenza. So it's, it's really a, a common finding. And next to these thrombi, which you can see here nicely on these pictures, we saw also NETs, so immunothrombosis, which are not the majority of thrombosis, but which is a finding in uh, infectious disease that you have a clotting of uh, a release of neutrophils, which uh, gave their DNA and, and fibrin to, to trap, trap um, um, germs and also viral particles uh, and provoke thrombosis. Then uh, next to the old techniques we used uh, in the autopsy hall, we did a um, molecular fingerprint of COVID-19 in influenza lungs to see is there a difference between the different kind of disease and different viral disease. Uh, so we see on the inflammasome, there's just one gene which is common expressed between COVID-19 and influenza. Whereas between angiogenesis, there are some more findings or more genes in these nanostring analysis. A very unique finding um, was the occurrence of interceptive pillars, so interceptive angiogenesis. Interception is a process which is um, very fast and relies on the incorporation of uh, circulating endothelial progenitor cells into the blood flow and into the vascular tree. So thereby, by this integration of these progenitor cells, you can uh, optimize and uh, the, the vascularity within minutes. Um, the contrast to this uh, form of angiogenesis is sprouting, which takes a time, which makes, needs proliferation, but interception is very, very fast. And we realized um, on this picture, you can see it here, tons of these marked holes, which are, which are transluminal pillars in the blood flow. So we quantify these um, pillars and you see that in uh, COVID-19, it's really a huge amount of these pillars that are expressed more, really more than in influenza and also more than in NSEIP and propotic lung disease. We had to publish these uh, findings of NSIP uh, early this year in the European Respiratory Journal. So interceptive angiogenesis is a, is, a, is a fast way to optimize blood flow in the lung. And this is also seen in other diseases, as, as I mentioned in NSIP, but also in pulmonary occlusive disease, which provokes this uh, new blood vessel formation, which overcomes um, the thrombi within these, or microthrombi within the circulation. And uh, this is also our synopsis where we find these interceptive angiogenesis features and other lung disease, not only influenza, but also in uh, UIP, uh, PVOD. So it's, it's a common finding uh, at a different uh, expression in these lung disease. Yeah, to conclude, um, this is a picture we published uh, in uh, the European Respiratory Journal and Editorial uh, last, in the last issue. So what are the main findings of uh, COVID-19 lung injury pattern? First of all, we find these interstitial pneumonia with the hyaline membranes. Then we find the thrombotic events, which leads to the um, disruption of the blood vessels and the new blood vessel formation by interceptive angiogenesis. And thereby I finish. So thank you very much for your time and your attention. And Thank you. As, as last, I think we have uh, a poll, right? And for uh, to conclude, I have a poll for you. So, which statement is correct for the COVID-19 lung injury pattern? So, SARS-CoV-2 infection due is primarily an adaptive immune response by B lymphocytes, uh, B immunothrombosis by neutrophils uh, or, or neutrophil extracellular traps is not evident in COVID-19. Endotheliitis uh, results in a homogeneous perfusion or perivascular T-cell infiltration and compensatory blood vessel formation by interception is correct 
characteristic for COVID-19. Okay, so D is correct. Thank you so much. Thank you, Max, for a great presentation and uh, many congratulations for your outstanding work in the pandemic time. Uh, you, you did achieve a lot. Thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to the discussion at the end of this webinar. So now it's my uh, great pleasure to, to um, invite my, my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Marion Delcroix from the University of Leuven. Uh, to uh, present a talk on COVID-19 in patients with pulmonary hypertension. PAH and CTEF will be the main focus of her presentation. So as you all know, uh, Marion is the uh, assembly head uh, for pulmonary uh, vascular disease assembly 13, and she has done outstanding uh, work in her term, and I would like to congratulate her for that. And I look forward to your presentation, Marion. Thank you, Mark. Good evening, everybody. And uh, I thank the chairs and the organizer for letting me do a presentation on COVID-19 in patients with pulmonary hypertension. I have no conflicts regarding this presentation. And uh, the outline of the presentation is the following. I will give you a, a summary of the current literature on the topic and also present you two surveys conducted during the early phase of the pandemic. One is a COVID-19 in PH patients based on reference centers information. And the second one is a patient survey on COVID. So this is a current knowledge. Here I present you the five paper, and I don't think I missed some of them, who contain some data on uh, the topic. The first one is a small survey from China, including 120 patients with pulmonary hypertension, very young patients. 6% of them had cold and fever. 2.5% were hospitalized. There were uh, three deaths, but which were pH related. And uh, an important point was that uh, one fourth of the patients had a treatment discontinuation in uh, Wuhan. This was from 11 March. Then we have a second report from the US. 32 centers reported 13 patients, seven hospitalized and one death uh, late March, which they consider very few cases for the US. Then we have a Spanish report uh, on a population of 350 patients uh, from the Madrid Center for Palma Hypertension, 10 experienced a uh, COVID infection, which was nearly 3%. 70% of the patients had hospitalization. There were no ICU and no deaths in these uh, small groups. Then we have something else, which is the report of the uh, pH activities in uh, the German centers. It is a multi-center study where our German colleagues reported that the number of new appointments and of the subsequently initiated pH specific therapies decreased by almost 50% during the months March and April. Finally, we have a more larger uh, survey in the US uh, based on uh, accredited US centers for pulmonary hypertension, uh, 58 of them reported 50 cases and represent an incidence of 2.1 cases per thousand pH patients. 30% of them were hospitalized, 22% in the ICU, 12% died, and this was uh, until uh, 1st of May. So this is all the data we have until now. And we have also a few paper uh, speculating on the organization aspects of the care of pH patients during the pandemic on some mechanism of action of medication, also the disease mechanism, which could influence the evolution of the patients. And also one paper on the therapeutic strategy of patients with uh, severe infection. But this paper contained no data. And so we thought there was a place for uh, something more in the domain. And so we presented here a, a COVID-19 uh, reference center survey in Europe, which was driven by the European Respiratory Society, together with the European Reference Network and with the Coppola uh, organization PH uh, Europe. 
And uh, this uh, is the report. So we included patients from the 17th April to the 10th May. There were 28 uh, countries participating with 47 centers, and they reported on 70 patients. This has been uh, published in the European Respiratory Journal Open Research. And so these are more uh, data on that. So the centers reported that they followed their patients uh, by means of teleconsultation and video consultation in 80% uh, of the cases. Only 10% of the patients had a normal consultation during this period. When we look at the palm hypertension classification, we have a majority of idiopathic pH, then we have connective tissue disease, CTEF and congenital heart disease, which are in fact the most uh, frequent category of severe palm hypertension. And we see also the age distribution with a median age of 50 to 59 uh, age. Concerning the treatment, uh, which is interesting, the majority of the patients, more than 60% uh, of them, were on uh, dual combination therapy, which is uh, the reference currently. And we had also um, patients on triple therapy, including also parental prostacycline. Concerning the CTEF patients, uh, the majority of them, two thirds of them, were inoperable patients uh, or patients with postoperative pulmonary hypertension. Uh, Eight percent were waiting for pulmonary endarterectomy. Seventeen percent were waiting for balloon pulmonary angioplasty, and eight uh, percent the balloon angioplasty was delayed uh, because of the COVID pandemic. Now, these are the presenting symptoms. Most of the patients, of course, uh, presented with pneumonia. There were very few pH exacerbation, no venous thromboembolies, and no hemoptysis reported in these patients. Their uh, duration of symptoms was uh, a median of six days. And uh, most of the infection were proven by a nasopharyngeal swab, a few patients by a low-dose CT. And uh, the majority of the CT showed uh, the typical anomalies of the uh, ground glass opacities. Now, this is then the hospitalization. Uh, nearly 50% of the patients were hospitalized in a normal ward. Uh, many could go home directly, and we have 11 of the 70 who were hospitalized in the intensive care unit. The hospital stay was a median of 3.4 days. And a majority were hospitalized in the reference centers uh, for palmar hypertension. This is the treatment then. You see oxygen therapy was given to majority of the patients. Uh, a low number need high flow nasal cannula and only seven of the 70, 10% needed invasive ventilation. There were no ECMO patients. And this is a pharmacological treatment. Of course, during the, the first phase, uh, we uh, give a lot of antibiotics, azithromycin, hydrochloroquine, of course. And uh, among the other, you had also some methylprednisolone. There were no patients on remdesivir at this time. So this is the summary, 70 patients with confirmed COVID-19, 44 hospitalized, 11 intensive care, a mortality of 19%, uh, a bit lower for patients with chronic thromboembolic pump hypertension, or where the mortality was only 14%. And I want to thank uh, the participating centers here who are with the PI, which is mentioned here. So, um, a few um, weeks after, um, uh, we decided also to conduct a pH care COVID survey for the patients. And there we associated also the European Society of Cardiology, same partners. And uh, this survey was designed to collect information on PA patients' lived experience and to understand how pH care was provided during the pandemic-related lockdown. There were 34 questions and uh, the demographics and disease-related information were questions, the COVID experience of the patients and also their pH disease management. You see here that we had uh, more than 1,000 patients included during the period of the 20th of May to the 28th of June. Uh, patients were coming from 52 countries and uh, the questionnaire was available in 16 languages. 
So the most uh, participants were coming from Belgium, France, Netherlands, Chile, Spain, Ukraine, and Portugal. But you see some, some countries also reported just one, uh, one patient. Sorry. Uh, here you have the, uh, the uh, characteristic of the patients. So uh, the median age was 50. There was a large majority of female as expected. The etiology was mainly idiopathic, congenital, CTEF and connect connective tissue disease related permahaptension. This is the treatment. Uh, of course, uh, many patients on oral treatment, but 21 patients on parental treatment, which is quite high. Um, and we see here that the patients were follow up in, um, in a pH center for 4.5 years in median. Um, during this period, the patients presented with symptom compatible with COVID in 53% of the patients. Of course, you see the very uh, specific signs, perhaps only the smell and taste decrease in 3% of the patients is something we, we identify also. And this is the number of patients who get uh, testing. Only 10% of the cohort receive a COVID test, and it was positive only in 10% of the cases. Um, the patients uh, were looking for contacts related to COVID. 20% uh, a bit more were searching contacts, and they mainly consulted GP more or, or nearly equally to their treating uh, physician. Uh, the hospitalization for COVID was reported only by 1% of the patients. And it was um, there in another institution most of the time. And the hospital stay was here six days. And only two of these 13 patients uh, were on intensive care unit. The cause of deterioration, so um, patients, 14% of the patients reported deterioration, which you see 1% was related to COVID, but 8% was related to the pH disease. And therefore patients uh, looked for uh, health contacts, many of them, and they were then con contacting mainly their treating physician for hypertension. The pH related to hospitalization were 4%, so four times more frequently than the COVID related hospitalization during this period. And there the patients were more going to their pH centers. They remained seven days in the hospital because of pH problems and six were on intensive care. So this is the difficulty that the patients encountered. 11% uh, reported problems to contact their pH team and 16% reported to have problems uh, for receiving their pH specific medications. Uh, they most of the time remained in contact with their centers by phone call and by email, but a significant proportion of them had absolutely no contact during this first wave of uh, the pandemic. Even 3% of the patients had a problem for shortage of medication. 27 patients had to stop because of shortage, and some of them even for more than four weeks. And some of them even had to stop the IV treatment, which is uh, a, a big problem and life-threatening, of course. So many patients ex experience anxiety and depression as, as many patients also in the normal population and they search information mainly by internet and uh, also by their uh, patient organizations. So I want to thank the National Patients Organization also and the PH specialists who have reviewed the translation in a native language. And so in conclusion, COVID-19 incidence in PH patients was low in both the center and the patient survey. The case fatality rate related to COVID-19 was rather high in comparison with the general population. The pH related problems were much more frequent than COVID related problems, including difficulties to access the specialist care and the specific medication. Patients more frequently relied on primary health care and patient organization and internet than usually. And further study are needed to evaluate the long-term consequence of COVID-related pH care disruption, and also whether tight adherence to social distancing is the main explanation or other physiological factor may prevent COVID-19 infection 
in CV upon my hypertension. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marion, for uh, your excellent presentation and for all the energy you and your team put uh, to handle the patients during this uh, very difficult pandemic. So uh, you were perfectly on time. Congratulations to all of you. So we have plenty of time for discussion as planned. Uh, I thank also Eric and Anita for pushing for answering some questions uh, in the box. And uh, I will start with the first question to Eric. Uh, we will go uh, in that sequence and then uh, anybody is welcome to ask questions in the chat box. So Eric, you, you did a lot and congratulations and you also replied lots of questions. Um, can you uh, explain to all uh, what is the meaning of elevated D-dimers in patients with COVID-19? What is the exact meaning? Uh, yeah, so the exact meaning of a D-dimer is the fact that there is fibrinolysis going on. And fibrinolysis is actually, it's a physiological process um, that occurs at a low level in anybody, also in healthy persons. But when there's a blood clot formed or when there's inflammation, especially in the combination of the two, the, um, there will be more uh, fibrinolysis going on and you will measure higher D-dimer levels. So higher D-dimer levels, they actually correlate to the presence of blood clots, the extent uh, of blood clots, and the extent of inflammation. <clears throat> so for these COVID-19 patients, they have higher D-dimer levels than healthy population, um, but um, it's very difficult to uh, use it uh, as a in, a in a different way than we normally do when we do a workup of suspected pulmonary embolism, because there have been many papers on different thresholds for optimal predicting mortality or ICU admittance or PE, but those are all post hoc findings, not validated. And I would stick to the fact that if you have a high D-dimer, the patient is probably more sick, but you don't need a D-dimer to establish this mostly. Um, and uh, if you suspect PE, the D-dimer can help you um, because if it's low, then PE is, is, is not present, but mostly it will be high and then you will need to proceed to uh, diagnostic imaging. Excellent. And uh, Anita, maybe you have a comment or maybe I follow. Uh, I, I have one, one question, which was a good one to, uh, to Eric as well, on the management of outpatients or non-hospitalized patients, which is a clinical dilemma who have as a moderate COVID, uh, they're breathless, they present to their primary care physician. Do you do a scan? W what is your usual management practice for this group? <clears throat> yes, so um, I think at, at the moment, all COVID-19 involved physicians know of this higher risk of, of PE. And when the physician actually is considering the presence of PE in a patient at home, he or she should refer the patient for a scan to the local hospital. And of course, it does not mean that we have to admit the patient, but just to have a formal diagnostic uh, concluded and we have a final conclusion and we can establish the, the indication of a therapeutic anticoagulation, which is very important also for the prognosis because um, uh, patients with pulmonary embolism should have an, a, an additional follow-up to only those with COVID-19 without PE. There's also a question, if I may refer to that, on whether we should provide patients at home with thrombal prophylaxis, which is, again, it's a, it's a dilemma. Randomized trials are going on. I'm aware of at least three in Europe. Um, but I think pragmatic until these guidelines are there, we should probably not treat all patients with thrombal prophylaxis, but stick to those um, uh, who have a, other risk factors for VTE, such as active cancer, periphery thrombosis, perhaps if they are completely bedridden, uh, you might consider also doing this uh, for those patients, but definitely not in all, because even anticoagulation at prophylactic doses will increase the risk of major bleeding. Excellent. Uh, maybe ask a couple of questions to Max. Uh, you gave uh, a good, uh, very good talk, Max. And there is a, a question in the chat box from an immunologist. And uh, you mentioned that the B cell um, uh, infiltrating cells were not identified in the lung. Uh, did you have evidence of uh, 
um, intraparenchymal uh, lymphoid follicles, as we can see, for example, uh, in uh, infectious disease or in autoimmune disease. Did you identify T tertiary lymphoid so organs? Yeah, so thank you for the question. So we see some B lymphocytes there, but the majority is uh, on neutrophils, but for sure, these perivascular accumulation of T cells. And if you have a look on the BALT tissue, but also on the perihelial lymph nodes, we realize um, a destruction of the germinal centers there. So we see lots of T cells there, and the germinal center itself are filled up with blood vessels. So um, it, it seems that you have a prolonged inflammation also in the ball tissue, but also in these lymph nodes along um, the lung. The explanation for that is for, for me until now not clear. So um, this is a study we, we did on, on 15 lymph nodes, but there, there are some observation that, that their T cell response is predominant and that the B cell reaction is uh, more or less impaired. But the reason for that could be an infection of the lymphocytes itself. But uh, so far, I think there's not really a, a huge uh, evidence to, sh to say, okay, it's um, that's the reason for these, um, these pronounced T cell reaction. All right. And there is a question in the chat box from Rosen Quark. Um, she's asking uh, when you refer to endothelial cell destruction, mm -hmm. do you refer to uh, endothelial cells targeted the disruption, or is it the whole endothelium uh, which is disruptive? It's, it's a whole blood vessel. So there's also an infection and, and you can see that also on the pericytes. So if you destroy endothelial cells, it's, it's clear that you also destroy pericytes. So I think it's a blood vessel itself. So, but, but, but these, uh, this function or this destruction leads to a chaotic blood flow and carotid blood flow increase shear stress and shear stress is, is the cry for help for the endothelium. And the, yeah, what, what the, the endothelium reacts by recruiting uh, circulating progenitor cells to overcome these, these clotting, to overcome these carotid perfusion. And, and this is the reason why you see it, especially in COVID-19, because it's a, it's a very pronounced global destruction of, of these uh, endothelial cells. Uh, and secondly, you see that, as I mentioned, also in other diseases, uh, CTEF or ILDs, um, and the same there, you find microtrombi in CTEF, you find microtrombi in ILD, and uh, this induces shear stress, induces um, um, anastomosis so to overcome these, these uh, hypoxia. And this is the reason uh, angiogenesis is a reaction to these chaotic perfusion um, induced by, by the viral infection. Thank you. Uh, there's a couple of points. Uh, there's, there's one uh, for you, Max, on how important uh, is the role of neutrophils and nets. And mm. one additional point is uh, there is this um, characteristic tree in bud appearance that's seen on CT scans, the dual energy CT scans um, reported by Bridge Patel, et al. and others. Uh, what, what is the patho, the, the path pathological correlate of this tree in bud appearance? So for the nets, I think uh, there are controversial observations on the mount of nets in COVID-19. It's a finding not only in the lung, uh, you find that in the kidney, you find it sometimes in the brain, also in the liver, but it's, it's a typical finding. Um, the question is always, if you analyze these thrombi, is, are these fireprint thrombi? Are these really real thrombi by platelets? Or are these nets? Um, I think the, the truth is something in between because we have, a we have also observed a release of megakaryocytes, sites, which did some thrombi within the lung. So I think it's a time of, it should correlate it with the correlation of the, uh, of the or the cause of disease, uh, which is dominating um, that. For your second question, I think the budding or the, that what you see in the micro CT, I think, uh, as, I, as I said, it's, it's a reaction to this uh, chaotic flow uh, of uh, the pulmonary circulation. And it's an it's a, it's a early repair mechanism, um, which prolong the reaction and which leads for sure, if you, if you in, increase angiogenesis, you increase also the flow of lymphocytes in the parenchyma. Uh, I think it's a, yeah, it's a, 
vice versa process. And um, this is the reason why maybe because and I want to mention that we, we got also biopsies from long holders. And in long holders, you see the same phenomenon. You see a prolonged angiogenesis in patients that are six weeks off of the ward. Uh, and it's, it's incredible to see that you have these high amount of blood vessels there. Thank you, Max. Very, very interesting. So a few questions to Marion. Uh, we, we have received a few. Maybe you have seen them in the, in the chat box. And we have also a, a question I've um, penciled in my, in my book. So the first one is many of uh, the patients with CTEF obviously are already on anticoagulation. Do you need any adjustment of the anticoagulants when the patient with CTEF is referred to your clinic with COVID-19 pneumonia? No, normally not. But uh, uh, I have to say that um, um, the most of the CDF patients have already been operated. So they are not as severe as the PAH patients that we have seen. So it's um, it's always has been a benign form, in fact. Yeah. And another question um, I've received, um, you have... Uh, many patients with PH, they were very well protected during the first surge of mm -hmm. the uh, COVID-19. During the second one, there were more uh, patients exposed. And okay. do, you, do you have any uh, uh, recommendation when a patient comes with PAH and severe COVID-19 pneumonia, mm -hmm. is there any restriction for using um, steroids, remdesivir, or any other uh, drugs you might wish to use, like tocilizumab. Do you have any uh, recommendation? No, um, I don't know what you do, but we have no special uh, care for them. We just apply the uh, the current protocols. Um, yeah, I which 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 was uh, for until now the remdesivir, but <laughs> we we are now in a bit of doubt, of course, <laughs> with the recent data. So. Yeah, in France, of course, steroids is the most likely drug to be given. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is no reservation for, for using that in pH. We sometimes use it for lupus. With no, where we have more problem is the, now the, the um, uh, infections with, uh, with Asperger is because of this uh, high use of uh, steroids that we are doing now. So yeah. we have much more secondary infections now. And uh, yeah, a final question to you, Marion. You work in a very famous uh, center with a lot of transplantation. What was the impact of the COVID-19 pneumonia first surge and second surge on your transplantation rate? Uh, on the transplantation rate, we, we uh, stopped two times. We, we completely stopped, stopped two times. The first time it was uh, more than six weeks. And now this time it was uh, two or three weeks. And still we are not do we are doing only the, the most severe patients for the moment. We have to prioritize some of them. Yeah, it's very important. Uh, our patients have uh, suffered a lot from the pandemic. And this is part of the problem, the transplantation access. Yeah. So maybe Anita, yeah? Just a, a quick point, Marion. I think you the lived experience survey raises extremely important points that actually affect other patient groups in that um, our, the patients shielded very well. So the frequency of COVID wasn't as great. Um, when they did get COVID, some of them were severely ill. I mean, we've seen that with the interstitial lung disease patients, for example. But a real organizational issue was the patient's didn't contact the specialist services. Um, perhaps they didn't want to worry the hospital teams because they were so busy with, with, with COVID. Uh, they got support from other areas, but it's, it's a message to us to do better in terms of managing our non-COVID patients as well as the COVID patients. And hopefully we've done a bit better in the second wave. Yeah, it's clear we have improved on our on our virtual mode of following the patients. Mm -hmm. um, we have, uh, of course, uh, you see that the patients where they had pH related problem, they they were able to contact the the, the patients before the COVID their first uh, touch to local care. 
What is also in interesting, I think, when you compare the two surveys, it's clear that the patient survey, there is an underestimation of the severe key case. And I think some patients were just not able uh, anymore to, to, to fill a survey. And when you have the center survey, we have an underestimation of the less severe case. So we probably have to mix the two numbers uh, and have a, a value which is in, in the center of the, of the of two extremes. Sure. So thank you so much. Uh, it's uh, almost 7 p.m. sharp. So I've been asked to, uh, to close on time. So first, uh, many thanks to the ERS office for organizing very professionally uh, this webinar. Thanks so much to Professor Simons for uh, stimulating me to put together this program and to, for joining. It was a great pleasure. I think uh, we have invited three superb speakers and uh, I think Anita and myself are really impressed and uh, very thankful of what you have done for the society. So Eric, Max and Marion, I, I see that you have been very active on, in the chat box, that's perfect. And you have said also that you are available for replying to questions via email. And uh, I'm sure the ERS office will put your email addresses on the, on the website. So that being said, uh, we want to do more webinars, Anita. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will, I think. More to follow. Next on uh, COVID and lung fibrosis, pulmonary fibrosis. Fantastic. So I will watch this one. <laughs> and uh, have a nice evening. And uh, thank you again for joining. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Au revoir. Thank <laughs> Au revoir, merci. Bonne nuit, good night. Merci beaucoup, Alice. Au revoir. Merci. Au revoir.